Hello, this is Kim McAllister and we're going to talk about health education. This is a series of videos in six parts. Health education is something that's very personally important to me. I am a advanced practice nurse educator in states that recognize nurse educator as an advanced practice, which Texas does not, but many states do. Um, health education is a process, it's any combination of learning activities or learning experiences that help and promote health. These are things that can help promote individual people's health or population health. It can be a class, it could be a diabetes education class, it could be uh, some type of education done at a senior center, it could be uh, one-on-one -on -one education that you do with patients in an acute setting. We're primarily going to be focusing on the community and the public health setting. So how do we develop education programs and education interventions to help people reach their optimal state of health? Uh, this presentation is designed to help you learn how to do that. So the purpose of health education is always to promote health, to prevent disease, and to maintain wellness. So we're going to give people tools, encouragement, and empowerment to make good decisions for their health and to keep themselves at their optimum level of wellness and also teach them ways to prevent uh, developing disease and to reduce their risk of health problems. So in order to teach people, you need to understand how people learn. And we, when we look at learning domains, we're thinking about the three main ways that people learn. First of all, there's the cognitive domain. This is focused on your frontal lobe of your brain. This is the part of your brain that um, is cognitively aware, the part that tells you, hello, we're here, we're participating in this discussion. Uh, it, this is where your memory is also located, which is in other parts of your brain besides the frontal lobe. But uh, this is the part of you that reasons and the part of your patient or your patients that can reason and problem solve. This is where you develop the ability to apply information. So we're learning information now about how to teach people and then you can turn around and apply it when you're working on your teaching project. So hopefully this will be a resource to you to come back to when you work on that project and um, this will help you with designing uh, an education program for that. So in order to teach something to patients, you have to, or people or populations, you have to know what they already know and what is their ability to learn. If you teach below someone's level, people feel like they're being condescended to and they will not listen to you. If you teach above people's level, then they may not understand what you're saying and they could become frustrated and again, will not listen to you. So it's very important to take time to assess. You can do that by engaging in conversation. You can hand somebody something and ask them to read something out loud to you. You can ask people what they norm, you know, how do you normally do this? How do you take your medication? Just generally engaging in conversation, asking people about their health status, what kind of health problems they have, and the things that they do to take care of themselves will not only give you that information that you're trying to elicit, but will also give you some information about their ability to understand. Look for clues like, uh, what kind of words are they using? Are they using polysyllabic words? Are they just using short words? Um, are they able to read something back to you? You can say, I'd like for you to take a look at this and tell me what you think, or these are some instructions I have for you. Could you please, please read it out loud for me so I know that you can um, see the type, that kind of thing. So this is how you would assess that. Next, we have the effective domain. This is the part of the learning process where that is influenced by your attitudes and values. 
you're trying to influence what people think and what people value. And you have to know that your attitude may differ from the client. So you need to ask the client what is important to them and why. Um, when we're talking about the effective, the effective domain, there is a series of processes that we go through and that the person goes through to fully um, integrate the information into the effective domain. And it begins with receiving. So first they receive the information that you tell them. And this is just a simple matter of I'm sitting here and listening to you and you're explaining to me that I have diabetes and now I have to check my blood sugar with this little machine that you've given me. So then the responding part is the next step and this is where you respond to what you've learned. This could be the response that you would make in a, in a class. It's very similar to the responses that you make in the discussion board to each other. So you've taken in information and you've thought about it for a moment and then you're responding to it. Then you have to go to the next level, which is valuing. What you're telling me has to be of value to me. So if I tell you that if you check your blood sugar, then you'll have better control of your diabetes and feel better, then this is something that I might consider doing. Uh, I know that doing this, this procedure is painful for just a moment and it's going to give me information that will help me control my diabetes. So then next you, the next level under the effective domain is um, organizing. You have to start to put this information and relate it to the beliefs and the values that you already have. So for instance, if a person has type 2 diabetes and they've been eating a lot of food that's high in calories. Maybe they're, it's their custom to eat a piece of cake or a piece of pie after dinner. And you are explaining to them that this is what is making them sick and making them feel bad and is keeping them from being healthy. So then they begin to understand that, okay, I've got to check my blood sugar. You know, I, I know I don't really want to, but you've told me this is going to make me better. And you've also told me that the way I'm eating is not really helpful for me. So I need to change the way that I eat. If I eat some fruit, a, just a certain amount of fruit, and then don't eat cake, that's something that's sweet, but it's also giving me fiber and some other nutrients. And that's really healthier for me. And so this is what the person is organizing and and trying to relate these new ideas to the ideas that they already have to their current beliefs. And then the final level of working through the effective dorm domain is the internalizing. And this is where the patient is uh, characterizing. It's really labeled characterizing, but when characterizing, they're internalizing all of these things that you've said and they have created new values. So now they've, they've, they've gone through the whole process of you want me to do something painful, you want me to change how I eat, and I'm, I'm thinking about doing this because you say this is going to make you better and I want to be better. And uh, then it characterizing, they've gotten to the point where this is what I'm going to do. I am going to make these changes. This is how I'm going to live now. So then the other part of uh, of learning is the psychomotor and this is performing skills that are going to require some coordination that could be bathing a child it could be changing the wafer on a stoma it could be injecting insulin or checking your blood sugar it could be any number you know maybe doing a dressing change these are all things that are psychomotor so think back to when you began nursing school and you learned for the first time how to check blood pressures you learned how to start ivs you learned how to insert ng tubes all of these are psychomotor skills and in order to perform a psychomotor skill the learner has to have the ability to do it they have to actually have the capability. Some people don't have the capability because of paralysis or paresthesia, or they may not have the uh, requisite knowledge for doing something. 
they have to be able to create a picture in their mind of what it's like to carry out this skill and then they have to have opportunities for practice. So when you're teaching a patient something like checking their blood sugar or checking their uh, or drawing up their insulin, they need to have an opportunity to practice it over and over again. So in assessing someone's ability to learn, you need to look at their intellectual ability. What is their level of understanding? Um, I don't want to talk down to you. I don't want to talk over you. I want to provide this education at the level that you need. You want to look at their emotional status. Are they ready to learn? Are they in the best possible position to learn? Uh, I, as a diabetes educator, uh, I was working in a hospital and a patient started yelling and I walked into the room. She was my next appointment. And she was yelling at the doctor and the doctor was yelling back. She was yelling at the doctor saying, I don't have diabetes, I don't have diabetes, I just don't have diabetes. And the doctor was saying, your blood sugar's 432. With a blood glucose that high, you have diabetes. You've got to check your blood sugar. You've got to take insulin. You've got to do all of these things. And she continued to yell at him and he yelled at her. And so then I asked the doctor just to step out of the room for a moment. And I sat down with the patient and I said, I'm sorry that you're having kind of a tough time. And she said, yeah. I said, would you tell me why it is that you can't have diabetes? And she looked at me with tears running down her face saying, I can't have diabetes because my mother died from diabetes last week. So this person was not in a position to learn and to hear what the doctor said. She also told me that she was on steroids and she felt like the steroids were driving her blood glucose high. And so I asked her if she would consider taking a glucometer home with her so she could check her blood glucose and then she could make a decision based on that about whether or not to take the medication that the doctor wanted her to take. And she agreed with that. So by taking time to find out what her emotional status was and why it was she was resisting, I was able to get her to a point where she would at least begin looking at how to take care of herself. Then we have to look at the physical ability. Does the patient or the person have the actual ability to carry out what they're going to do? If someone is totally blind, it will be difficult for them to draw up insulin out of a syringe. So then we would go to some other insulin delivery system. So we have to look at, at the ability of the patient to actually do the thing that we're asking them to do. So this concludes part one. Next, we're going to move into some learning theories. So we'll look at that in part two.